everybody to Cask and Classics. I am Tommy Moriello. I am joined by the handsome Mr. Matthew Wozniak, brand specialist for the Glen Rothes, and the also handsome and talented <laughs> Mr. Mark Beckman. Uh, Mark Beckman is a digital currency and NFT expert. Would that be a good way? Sure. And I've had the pleasure of talking with Mark for the last few weeks without actually talking to him through his book. Um, digital artwork blockchain technology all about nfts and it's we're going to go on a wild ride today with these nfts we're going to talk about blockchain we're going to talk about drawing cats we're going to talk about restaurants in aspen right um but would love to touch on how you got involved with this project for the launch of the glenn roth a single cast uh this lovely 36 year old uh label behind you by artist maddie die um she super, super talented and you were able to bring her level of artwork to another level through an NFT and put an added value on this already delicious liquid. So how did you get involved in this pro project and wh what was your role in it? Yeah, it was pretty amazing actually to go back to day one. We met with uh, the Glenn Roth's executive team and I remember it was at a time where there was basically no one on the streets and people weren't like fully immersed yet in the world. And we had this vision of like the world coming back to life in the springtime and how cool and innovative and groundbreaking it would be if we were able to leverage Web3 technology to bring the Glen Rothes forward. So this idea of the juxtaposition of the old world, what about 150 year old, um, distillery essentially, coupled with the modernity of Web3 technology, specifically on the NFT and the blockchain side of things. So we sat down with your team, we charted out a plan. Um, we were very excited to be able to leverage this New Yorker style of illustrations with the artist Maddie Dye at the helm and bring that to life in a updated way, um, as you are both aware the NFT uh, comes to life with um, you know, movement and colors that really have never been seen in a New Yorker styled illustration before. Absolutely. And to scale back a bit, what is Web3? So I use Web3 today as do a lot of my peers as an umbrella term to bring the key elements of, um, of this technology to life. So to me, Web3 includes NFTs, blockchain, cryptocurrency, the metaverse, the digital wallet piece. So all of those key, key pillars um, are, are standing below the concept of Web3. Excellent. Like when you're reading an article from the government and they have all these several different acronyms, you just loop them all together. Correct. It. Make it easy. <laughs> Simple. Web3. Um, and you said something very ridiculous. It's a mouthful to say blockchain and Especially Absolutely. if you're having a few sips of the Glen Roth, is, yeah. it becomes complicated, right? Indeed. Yeah. Um, you said something very specific there in blockchain. Now, the whole, just like with the Glen Rothes, we have a specific way of where the Glen Rothes will live. Uh, we, as members of the Glen Rothes, are the supplier, which goes to the distributor, and the distributor gets it out into market, and then they give it to the liquor stores and the bars and whatnot. Um, so, for an NFT to reach its first and other owners, it has to go through the blockchain. So can you explain that blockchain for us? Sure, so the simple way to break it down is think of the blockchain as a ledger and it records essentially um, different data or different information in a chronological way. So as more information is recorded within this blockchain ledger, the, le the blockchain itself continues to grow and advance forward. The blockchain is also interesting because it's completely transparent. So every, um, every element that's recorded within that blockchain is open to the public to see. And that therefore gives us proof of ownership as well as provenance. So if an individual purchases one of these limited edition bottles of um, the Glen Roth is, and they collect the NFT with it, and then trade it to a friend, and then that friend trades it to another friend, we can actually see the movement of that NFT from party to party, and then prove that it's authentic as well. That's really fun. And there's, a, Matt, you could touch more on this, but there's so many different levels the Glen Rothes takes 
en route to the final product, right? So if you want to explain in Jerez, Spain, um, that's the first stop, right? We have our cast being made and they all go on through. Exactly. Um, how, how would the, the road for the Glen Rothis, if the Glen Rothis road is a blockchain, how would we go through that? Um, so as far as the blockchain goes, I can't really speak to that, Mark, you're obviously the expert. Uh, but for Glen Rothis, you know, it essentially starts with the fundamentals. You know, we're going to be using the, the water, the barley, um, arguably, most importantly, the wood as well. That's going to give us, you know, determining a lot of the quality of the, the final product. Um, essentially, what we're doing is putting the whiskey in casks and letting it age until it's ready to go. Once it's been, um, you know, aged the appropriate amount of time, then it's bottled. Uh, and then it goes to the consumer. So it is a multi-step process. And I would imagine there has to be some similarities between the way an NFT is developed, it's implemented into the blockchain, and then how it's received by, um, I guess you could say the customer as well. So from from like a conceptual standpoint, you know, we're, we're doing the distillation, we're creating this, this new make spirit. Is there a similarity between creating this new spirit and creating an NFT or are there like steps that are replicated with each NFT that's created while it's put into the blockchain, or is it very much uh, different between each person that creates it? So, um, you know, it's interesting that you raise that topic because I believe 100% he's like a soothsayer. He's predicting the future. I guarantee you at some point, brands that have such prestige, true, truly luxury items like the 36 are going to, um, create a relationship between, let's say, the process, the production, mm -hmm. um, starting from its conception all the way through the barrel and the bottling and then where the bottles go, we could track that and trace it along the blockchain. So an individual knows that they're getting what they're getting and when it's created and how it was created from the outset. Every single one of those moments that you highlighted will be at some point, in fact, recorded on a blockchain, especially for collectible items like the 36. And that's what I find to be so cool, the, the true ownership of something. When you purchase a bottle of alcohol, yes, you own it, but you need someone like Matt, like myself, like Sebastian, like Erin, who, who are all on our team, to educate you on that bottle. If the Glen Rothis itself was an NFT and the breakdown on everything that went into that bottle was on a blockchain, I think that would be remarkable. And the romantic stories that you always say from literally grain to bottle, you would understand it and it's verified and it's truthful. Yes, we know we're telling the truth with our 100% malted barley, with our Oloroso Sherry season cast from Jerez, Spain, our Coopers at the distillery. We say all of this and you have to take our word for it. <laughs> and at the end of the day, it's all words. And if you translate that into blockchain and you could follow all of those steps that are verified and proven, I think that's remarkable. It's totally remarkable. And I think that there's going to be real financial value also for the collectors in the category, right? Because then they have proof of ownership. Once it's once the NFT is minted on the blockchain, that's immutable, so it cannot change. And that's something they'll be able to pass along generation to generation, much like our parents and grandparents have done with like a certificate of authenticity accompanying a fine piece of artwork. Absolutely. And to break down the word NFT, non-fungible token. I purchase an NFT. As soon as I purchase it, it can't be transferred for anything else other than what it is, including the cryptocurrency that it's on, correct? Correct. It's a one of a kind. More or less, unique, correct. More or less. For the sake of this conversation, for, yes. yes. It does get complicated, like I said, there will be cats involved, there will be Aspen restaurants involved. Well, there's some <laughs> tech that allows you to go cross chain now. But Excellent. to really break it down simple for both of you, Think about, I, I teach people this. So like think about an NFT literally as a digital vessel and anything you could stick into that digital vessel, whether it's a piece of artwork, VR, AR, music, film, think of it as like almost like a cardboard box, but it's digital. Whatever you could stick into it, that NFT effectively creates um, a vessel that will move 
from entity to entity or individual to individual if it's passed along. The uniqueness of the NFT, the non-fungible part of it, is when it's minted into the blockchain. That's when it becomes a one of a kind. So even if there are 50 pieces of artwork, or in this case, 168 pieces of artwork, each artwork stands on its own. It's non-fungible. So if you have the second minted piece, it's only it's the only second minted piece of artwork. So it really stands on its own. Absolutely. Does that make sense? Yes, it does. Does that make sense to you? It does. I, I find that quite interesting as well because something the the whiskey community in general is always combating is, um, you know, essentially not only copyrights but you know duplications and um, what's the word I'm trying to come up here? Counterfeit. Oh, Counterfeits. Yeah. So what I find really interesting is the the whiskey community in general is always combating counterfeit items because there is a supply and a demand and more often than not, the demand exceeds the supply. So is there anything, what security measures, I guess you could say, go into the blockchain and into NFTs to prevent them from being counterfeit or being duplicated? So that's the essence that what you're talking about right now is the essence and the value of the relationship between an NFT and the blockchain. So once that NFT is minted on the blockchain, it can never be changed. It can never be adjusted. It could never be modified. And as a result of that, there's no fraud. Okay. There are, um, there is some malintent within the community right now where people are like stealing assets and all, but still at the end of the day, that NFT, once it's permanently embedded into the blockchain, it stays in its form. That's all defined by a smart contract. So the coding, that we put into a smart contract typically says what rights come along with the digital asset, okay. right? That defines to the individual um, uh, what their ownership rights are and effectively doesn't permit the party that's holding the asset to change that asset at all. Interesting. Wow. Which is remarkable. Right? Yeah. If you, look, if you look back then, there's so looking back at our relationship with Analog Shift, which is a fantastic vintage watch company uh, that's under the Watches of Switzerland umbrella. And the watch community understands that this in so many ways. You would have several different type of Rolexes, Honorais, Omegas, and on the outside, it looks just like the watch. But if you open it back up, it could be mixed around different, different movements in different places, things that were not part of the original watch that are all thrown away. Sure. And that watch now is not worth the amount of money it should be because it's a quote unquote Frankenstein watch and doesn't have the original movements. It's with, it's not easy to do that. You have to understand watches to do that, but it's easy to break it down and do it for the un, untrained eye to sell them something that is not worth what they're paying for. Mm -hmm. Having this in the digital world, having this on the blockchain, and having it be impossible to alter, the level of ownership that you have of this particular item being any type of NFT out there makes it even more unique. It's I could change anything. I could I could call, uh, I believe, uh, the show Shameless uh -huh. when they were trying to market their new bar. Yeah, and she digs out a bullet hole and she puts Al Capone shot this year in 19 centuries. No one's going to know it's true. Mm -hmm. And it's right. You know, it, 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 it's, it's remarkable how people could alter certain things for the truth. Digital currency, NFTs, blockchain takes out all of that. Correct. Takes out all malice and shows that what you're getting is truly what you're paying for. And it's unadulterated. It's on, it, it's, it's as it's in its prime form and forever will be. Correct. And it also has the impact of empowering creators and creatives, right? Because it allows now for the smart contract to pay those individuals if they choose in perpetuity. So it's an amazing idea that extends in so many different ways. So, you know, when you talk about, um, you know, the, the relevance as it could go from generation to generation and decade to decade, that payment structure also follows decades. So think about like, if Picasso was able to feel the benefit of his um, secondary market sales or peer-to-peer -peer sales um, in perpetuity, right? Like the artists before, the modern artists, Matisse, Picasso, it goes even extends into like even like current like cool artists that we were alive with, like Keith Haring and Warhol, 
they unfortunately couldn't lock their artwork into a blockchain and take advantage of all secondary market sales for payment structure. Absolutely, and your work of art will live forever, but you do not benefit off of that. Your family will benefit off of that, exactly. besides the cloud aspect to it. Correct. And I think that whole cloud aspect to it plays a huge game right now into the world of NFTs as well. And as we go into how your how NFTs become more profitable, one, you need to create an NFT that someone is interested in, correct? So the Glen Roth has created an NFT for its consumer. We came out with a delicious 36-year-old cask. And Matt, you could explain more about it. Why, why is this cask so desirable? So that's actually a really good point. I'm glad you brought it up because I wanted to digress back to your Frankenstein statement about the watches and selling what is like perceived value. Um, I'm going to kind of tie that into a question for you, Mark, if you don't mind. This particular hogshead cask that we used for the Glen Roth is 36, uh, 160 balls in total, all from one single cask. It's basically a one-stop shop for this whiskey. Uh, there's no marriage of spirits or uh, blending, no Solera, anything of that sort. Um, that alone adds a very large value to it. Uh, the time and maturation process, uh, 36 years of watching after this cask, making sure it's in the right area, um, you know, maintaining it, I guess you could say, um, also adds to the value. Um, so the value is definitely there in a very tangible form. Where do you get the value for these NFTs? Is that, is that like a market value? Is it a, a subjective perceived value? Where, where do you find a lot of the value in these NFTs coming from? Like, it, how do they find some it, of these? It's a great question actually, actually, Matt. And people ask me this over and over again. And what I do is I try to give it um, an example. Like we can actually bring it home with, with regards to whiskey. Um, so whereas a whiskey fan and collector might say, you know what, this new 36 is actually worth a lot more than $3,600. It might be worth, can I get into, I'm sorry guys, can I get into pricing on that or is that like a- By all means, yeah. Okay. I mean, with, when you get into the second tier market, we put the value of it of what we want it to be, correct? So from there, whatever the market believes that the value actually is, that's out of our hands. Correct. Yeah. So, so the so the the idea of letting the marketplace establish the value and the perception of value is really based on the individual, right? Like mm -hmm. your father or your best friend might say, you know what, this whiskey isn't for me. I wouldn't spend ten dollars on it. Mm -hmm. But yet we know there's a real demand, and people will spend north of thirty six hundred dollars. This thing, in a short period of time, could become worth more than ten thousand dollars. Especially if there's such a limited supply of it. There's only one hundred and sixty eight of it. Correct. It's you might love wrestling, I might not care about it. You might put value on a wrestling t-shirt, I might put no value on it. Your uh, mother might love an Hermes Birkin bag and be willing to spend 30,000 on it. My mother might think that's ridiculous and she's gonna go to TJ Maxx, which mm -hmm. if she hears this interview, she's gonna slap me around, <laughs> right? So what we, we are as humans are, we're not necessarily looking for the utilitarian value of a spirit, right? We're figuring out on our own what the value of that is, and that sets the marketplace. What's interesting, though, about this situation with the Glen Roth is, is we created more than just digital art as it relates to the NFT. We did, in fact, um, include the idea of a utility-based NFT. So the holders, the owners of the bottle, have exclusive access to the NFT. The owners of the NFT then can have unique experiences that are exclusive to them, such as visiting the distillery in the Roth in Scotland. Um, so that value proposition expands or should expand pretty in a pretty meaningful way because it's going to unlock these unique experiences and unique services exclusively to the owners of the bottle and the NFT. And so, I'm sorry. Please. Um, that's where <laughs> NFTs become extremely exciting because Again, we talk about the untrained eye. As someone that is involved in cryptocurrency and doesn't understand yet what NFTs are or what the metaverse will be and are just getting inclined to it, you're giving people something that they could touch, that could, they could communicate with. You're inviting them to an actual event. It's not just, I bought a JPEG. 
So you more know? and more, we're we're bringing the worlds of URL and IRL together, and that's certainly happening in this instance with the Blender Office. So think of it as like almost a private, exclusive club. So you might be a collector of whiskey and feel like you're in a club already because you have a collection. You might own, you know, the 36. But what this does, the NFT does, is it opens up to another level of exclusivity, a VIP membership. And those type, that type of access is um, uh, akin to something that one couldn't achieve or ascertain, but for holding the asset. And what's Matt and I have run into so many different people that want to tell us all about their whiskey collection. And that's why whiskey people are amazing. Mm -hmm. they, they, and they're knowledgeable, they understand their spirits, and they love to share their spirits. And you can't explain exactly what you have. Most of the times you have to go to their, their at-home bar to see their collection. Now, through blockchain and through NFTs becoming more popular, I could show you my exact whiskey collection on my phone. Mm -hmm. So I could show you the Glen Rothes 36, I could show you the Glen Rothes 42, the Glen Rothes peak cask, whatever it may be, I'm making things up now, but just for the sake of the argument, I could have my at-home bar on the blockchain. And you know, like you could talk to people again, It's, I think it's a New York thing, right? You said, we talk, you're, you're a native of New York, I'm a native of New York. Mm -hmm. Matt, you have the clout of being a native in, of New York. <laughs> we, we hereby bless you as a New Yorker, <laughs> even, 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 even though you're a West Coaster. <laughs> but I think that specifically with New Yorkers, if something seems too good to be true, it's not. Show me. It's yeah. It, Show it's, me. I, I, you have to. I, you have to earn my trust in every which way, and I will poke holes in the game and totally. call call you out on things that I think are false. Blockchain technology and the NFTs. Everything. The proof is in the pudding. The whole world gets to see it. It's yeah. totally transparent. All you have to do is literally go look at the blockchain, and you see all of the digital assets. You see. You could go back and see who owns it. It doesn't disclose your individual identity, but it shows your wallet, it shows who holds it, um, and then you see where it goes forever. And the way that NFTs have been used specifically, you mentioned the pandemic, it's, it's helped our industry significantly. And in your book, you talk about the restaurant in Aspen that was selling the NFTs um, for a, a pre-purchased dinner. Yeah. Can, you, can you go into that? Because I thought, that was one of the coolest things I've read in terms of an NFT and how it was developed. Well, it's interesting. That was one of the things that brought me into the space. And the idea was to, um, it was really a move to, a movement to make sure that employees in the hospitality category in general, um, think in terms of chefs, um, waiters, waitresses, bartenders would have their jobs in these you know, amazing places in these amazing restaurants and amazing hotels post pandemic. So the idea was we all love restaurant X and we're all gonna go there, we know eventually. So the concept that we came up with was if you purchase this NFT for X amount of dollars or cryptocurrency at this moment in time, which is below fair market value, it will allow you post pandemic access to these restaurants at these rates and the flow through of money that we were able to collect during the pandemic um, helped keep people in the industry um, you know, really alive, if you really think about it, because they weren't being paid. A lot of those people lived on um, really not paycheck to paycheck, but on tips. So Absolutely. when everything was closed down, they didn't have a chance to earn. So what we were trying to do was um, get, get future value um, in, in the hands of the NFT holder so that we could pass along the monies that we collected to uh, leaders and, and people that work in the industry. Which is tremendous because an industry that was affected wholeheartedly throughout the pandemic was the hospitality industry. Yeah. And again, the birth of this Casting Classic series was to try to put butts in the seats to venues, right? bring people out, show people we're not filming live today, but others have been and trying to engage our consumers and bring life back to it because those are the people that need it the most. Yeah, we and should be shooting live though. Yeah, absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. Um, it's we, we have a few more plans for the Inn and Irving place and we'll, we'll definitely get some more going up there. Cool. Right now to use this backdrop and something that you were a part of, we definitely wanted to get you in front of this guy. Love it. Yeah, so, but it, it also shows that an NFT doesn't have to just be a piece of art. 
the the NFT world can be extremely broad, which is what engages me wholeheartedly in it. You know, and you mentioned in your book with things with sports mm -hmm. and the, the route that basketball took, um, and now we go from drawing cats, mm -hmm. right? Like there was, can you tell the story of how the the, the, the cat drawings became extremely popular? And crypto being... kitties, yes. So crypto kitties was one of the first major projects. Um, I could be mistaken, but I'm almost certain that the company that created and financed crypto kitties originally is Dapper Labs. The same company that um, today built up NBA Top Shot, which Amazing. is exceptional. And I actually think that Nas, the hip hop artist, is an early investor in all of that. But CryptoKitties <laughs> came out of the gate, I think it was in 2017. It was really one of the first projects and people went crazy for it. They invested and the, um, the ownership value of that asset literally has continues to go like this. It's one of the biggest projects. But the money in the NFT market today is remarkable. In 2022, the amount of money that transferred from an individual wallet into an NFT marketplace, effectively like NFT sales, was equal to, I think it was $40 billion. So far in 2022, between the first of the year and May 1st, we've already recorded um, about $33 billion in NFT transactions. So we're tracking right now, we're on, on pace to surpass last year's huge, huge numbers. This is, so this is here to stay, it's not going away. And moving beyond CryptoKitties, we've seen all of these other fantastic projects that people use as PFPs, ranging from, um, you know, uh, Board Ape Yacht Club to Moonbirds, which just had about a $500 million um, sale just recently within the past couple of weeks. This is going to continue to grow. What we're going to see next though is kind of what we're touching on today with the Glen Roth is the increase of people buying and using NFTs for utility purposes. What is this, what is this NFT going to get me beyond the PFP or beyond being a part of this community? Can I get access to limited edition merchandise? Can I get access to unique experiences? Can I get some type of a service that I couldn't get otherwise? So we're gonna see the utility NFTs growing, and then we're also gonna see um, the advent of great technology to transform the art itself, like composable NFTs, where a person could buy NFT number one and NFT number two, and with that, a third exclusive NFT comes to life. So you end up with three pieces of artwork, composable. Um, so we'll see a lot of that in you know 22 and into 23 as well. For some reason, my mind goes to Ralphie from A Christmas Story <laughs> with his decoder. It's in the crummy commercial. Be <laughs> <laughs> sure to drink your own too. Yeah. But it's, and I love that this project specifically with the Glen Rothes, it's, it's been a mind, blowing thing for me because I we understand whiskey and whiskey consumers and I think that Matt is one of the best whiskey minds that I've come across I Matt truly understands his liquid truly is passionate about his liquid what goes into the bottle knows how to speak of it knows what's good and knows what's not and Matt does an amazing job in market going out and preaching that word and educating people on spirits on the Glen Rotha specifically and with that now, we have a new way to fill the seats. People love whiskey. People are extremely passionate about whiskey. We do events weekly, some two to three times a week of educating people and showing them why we feel Glen Rothis is at the level that it's at, why this bottle is warranted for that $3,900. And now by incorporating Maddie Dye, incorporating this style of artwork that is in the hearts of New Yorkers that go out every single day. They, they see it, they identify with it, they embrace it. We are now able to build a following of 168 people that know where to go for their education. Correct. They can go in and we're speaking directly to them. Correct. And, and that passion now will, can grow through this brand. And I, and Matt can say this as well. We want people drinking all types of whiskey, right? There's no such thing as bad whiskey. There's just some whiskey that's better than others. And it's, we're showing why we feel 
our whiskey is is better than than others and to have that rolodex of people to come on in and to show them thank you so much here's an added value here's an added gift please come join us at the Glen Rothfuss home next to me in an Irving place for a guided tasting with Matthew. Uh, please come on in and see Sean Penn and his amazing Rolodex of uh, new gear, new suits. To see JP Rodriguez's five stages of the brain, to see a 42, 45 year old watch that came out at the exact same time that the cast would lay down to rest. We get to showcase and show these people all of these cool things that we're doing and it's above social media it's above you following us on instagram it's above you following us on facebook and on top of all of it it's authentic and it's verified you know that you're getting educated and being told all of this valuable and amazing information from the source it's not someone coming off of the streets being a poser or faking that they're somebody that they're not it's all verified through the blockchain. And I think the word ownership has never been truly understood before NFTs of blockchain. Yeah, it's amazing. And to be honest, like you talk about communicating with the community, what the NFT also provides for is the brand to access that individual regularly. So those individuals that own this bottle and this NFT shouldn't be surprised if perhaps the Glenn Roth is airdrops a new NFT with a new message um, where they might be able to see you and Matt at a, you know, at a new location with a new event. So it's amazing that this technology opens up that direct line with your, um, with your base as well. It's awesome. We always want to reward our drinkers and now we have a, reason to, uh, a way to do so. Of course. And that's something I was curious about as well, because you mentioned the utility NFT. And I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, but we could essentially like use an NFT in conjunction with perhaps an invitation to a dinner, correct. an exclusive whiskey pairing, correct. Uh, a release such as this. And on top of it, you know, being in the NFT and the blockchain, it would then in a sense become a tangible item because you're coming to a location, you know, perhaps getting an education, a tasting, a dinner. Mm -hmm. um, is that kind of where like the future of it's heading? Very like, because I know you had mentioned the utility aspect. Yeah. Do you see that taking I'm more residence over the, the artistic side of it? Yes, I am very excited about this blending of the worlds of IRL meets URL. Mm -hmm. um, taking the digital asset and using it to access live concerts, live dinners, access to new product drops, um, unique experiences, meeting stylists, meeting fashion designers, getting on like a high speed boat ride. All of this is happening in our world right now. And I think the fact that we're protecting the individual asset holder by ensuring that this is ownership, it's authentic, is you know a very interesting tool. The other thing that happens is it allows for us to um, like I said, create this direct line of communication. Remember, it's all decentralized. So now the Glen Roth is, could speak directly to um, its fan base and offer these unique experiences in a way that it's never been able to do before. And you have this unique item in with an NFT, but it also shows how unique this bottle is. And Matt guided us through a tasting of it on our launch night. Um, last month on the 28th, and it's a delicious whiskey, if I must say so. Um, my question is, what will last longer, the NFT or the bottle? The whiskey is meant to be drank, right? You're right. So we're, we're assuming people will be opening this whiskey up and drinking it, but as we've seen with spirits in general, single malt scotch in particular, that that will continue to grow. And there are some bottles of single malt scotch that could potentially put a kid through school. <laughs> um, but there are also some NFTs that hold the same level. So in, in terms of lifespan, assuming that the, the bottles will be consumed or the bottles will never be opened, what, where do you feel, what will have a longer lifespan? So, or the, so here's the, the thing that's interesting on the tech side, these um, NFTs are not stored on like AWS or like a cloud. They're actually on IPFS. So they literally can last forever which is super unique, right? As it's long like, as someone is running that platform. Well, it, more or less, yes. Yeah. Um, 
So they literally could outlast the bottle itself and the person that's the original owner. That's really interesting because, Tommy, like you said, there's only a finite amount. Let's take the 36, for example, 168 bottles from start to finish. That's all there's ever going to be. And there's only to become less and less over time. So I think we're going to see the value increase over time. However, do you see that possibly with NFTs as well? Because if they have this infinite lifespan, do you possibly see their, their potential value going up? Because, uh, you know, unlike a, um, you know, an exquisite painting that might get damaged and then it's gone forever, you know, the NFTs aren't going anywhere. So do you see their, their value increasing? Or so, they, so it could increase in value based upon the quality of the artwork mm -hmm. and it could increase on, in value based upon the utilitarian nature that's built in. Okay. So I might not have been fortunate enough to get one of the 168 bottles, but I really want to visit the distillery. I truly want to go to that live event. So to me, if I could go to the distillery, perhaps with a guest, to me, that's worth $5,000. So I might turn around to you and say like, look, you have your bottle, but I want your NFT. And I could pay more money to get access to that unique experience and service. So there's gonna be a lot of secondary market value to, these, to this artwork as well. I think we'll see collectors of the whiskey um, trading uh, to get access, other people to get access to the events and so on. Because people want to go on that speedboat with the map. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> but but on, on top of that though, now, once that, that ownership trades happens, mm -hmm. on the blockchain, it still shows that I was an owner of this NFT. Correct. As say now, you bought purchaser 5,000. Yeah. As we go on, we have several more releases, NFTs coming with that. But to get the next few releases of Glen Rothas, or to go on that next big trip, or the speedboat with Matt, um, it increases in value. So that five thousand might go to ten, might go to twenty, might go to forty thousand dollars. The original owner, being on the blockchain, does he see any of that? No, or she? Excuse me. No, any of the va of the increase yes. in value. No. Typically, what happens is. The creator of the NFT is built into secondary market and peer to peer. Like your Picasso analogy prior. Correct. Got exactly. It. So the, the that's why it's a fantastic tool for like the creatives all over the planet because very often they're not fully compensated for their artwork. And then also once the artwork sells over and over again and increases in value, they don't see any of that benefit. Now they can. Amazing. That's 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 it's really creating cool. a new economy, honestly. Yes. It's um, a lot of my peers that are um, in the tech space that live in communist ruled nations like China talk to me about how NFTs for them are freedom. And for the first time ever, they could use this technology to have access to any of the content. Like they can't see the same movies or listen to the same songs that perhaps we as New Yorkers have access to. Big Brother is completely cut out of the situation. Mm -hmm. They So they can now, you and I can send a movie over them. We could be paid for it, by the way. Um, and because it's a decentralized world, there's no third party government entity to stop that transaction. They also can earn money, um, which is great because obviously with the um, uh, earning of money comes autonomy, economic freedom, and that typically the other rights fall into mind. So. And the benefits that you get from the ownership of the NFT are remarkable. Like you said, like you have events that you go to, the distillery visits, it, you, you could profit off of it. And once I'm done, I did everything I needed to see. I went on the speedboat with Matt. I went to the distillery. Now I could sell these experiences to the next person and I could profit off of that. Correct. So where my mind goes, and I'm sure that all of us have come up and seen fraud on our accounts, right? Your, mm -hmm. your, your Capital One bill is charged in Idaho at a Walmart for $1,500 in uh, gift certificates. Um, how are you protected in the world of crypto and on the blockchain from like, how is the cybersecurity for your NFT wallet? So, wallet? so what I'm finding is this, there's, there's fraud, but it's really happening by the people. So your crypto wallet is secure, but if you link it in a live way to a live platform, you're exposing yourself. 
So what people will do is they'll create a cold wallet that's not linked to anything that typically holds most of their assets, whether it's cryptocurrency or NFTs. This way it's safe. You can even remove it in a custodial way um, off of everything so that you have it physically in your pocket. Okay, you could do that. But what's happening is there's a lot of fraud, right? So you need to pay attention to scams essentially so that you don't lose your digital assets. It's not rampant, it's not widespread, but we're reading a lot about it because, you know, similar to the Beeple piece of artwork that sold for 69 million, it's like watching a train, you know, a train wreck or, or driving past a car accident. Like you have to see the $69 million sale, you have to see these. Um, you know, fraudulent types of scenarios. So it's not crazy, but you need to pay attention. You can't just trust everybody that you run into. In Absolutely. Life. And with everybody. But, the, but blockchain is secure, the NFTs are secure, and your wallets are safe too. But you just need to pay attention. Absolutely. And it seems, from the research I've done, they're extremely secure. And it takes a very talented mind to infiltrate a blockchain. Like I said, or you're by far, a majority of of um, the situations are just scammers taking advantage of, you know, a trusting person. It's click on this link for the new car that you want. Oh, I want a car. It's literally that. Use your it's literally yes. that. Like, I have so many friends that have lost now millions of dollars worth of like the apes of board apes because they're in a Discord room and they trust and um, they while they're doing this is like so called experts people that have been in the community for a long time like. While they're doing it, they realize something's wrong, something's not kosher, but they do it anyway, and then all of a sudden they lose their asset. When that happens, remember, this is a decentralized world we're talking about. So it's not like you could get on the phone and call Amazon and be like, where's my box? Who stole my box from my lobby? I obviously, I obviously wasn't there. You check on the camera. I live in New York. I wasn't in Idaho. There's, there's no, there's no, there's no one call. answering yes. the call because there's no one to call. That's it. It's yeah. decentralized. So you gotta pay attention. Indeed. And you said um, a Discord room uh, for someone that is getting into crypto, blockchain, meta. What is a Discord? So, you know, we were talking earlier. I love this analogy. Somebody said it to me. Um, Discord is to new NFT launches like the line at Supreme and getting an old wristband is to the next drop. But really what Discord is doing is it's creating communities. Um, they talk about the projects together. They understand, um, they get some alpha. I don't know, are you familiar with the term alpha? No. So alpha is kind of like inside information within the Web3 community. Okay. So if you're in a Discord community, if you're part of a project, typically you're sharing alpha. When's the next product drop? When's the next, how do I access it? Um, is there a whitelist? Can I be first to buy? Um, these types of this type of information is typically happening in Discord. The Discord rooms currently with these different projects are a great place for a starter to learn a lot about what's coming down the pipe. If they're thinking about investing, if they want to see whether or not projects are real, the owners are real, if there's going to be value to it, try to insert yourself into a few Discord rooms to learn. Like what we did a few weeks back in Mohegan Sun, it's the Whiskey Festival. You, before you purchase the bottle, Taste it, see what you like it and whatnot. Um, the, the consumer sampling is that we do to engage our consumers as well. Totally. Matt, how um, how do you feel a a whiskey can, uh, a, how do you feel a fan of whiskey would approach an NFT? What, where, 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 would, where would a whiskey drinker start? So for myself, um, you know, being relatively new to NFTs, the concept and the principle behind them Finding out that Glen Rothis has an NFT, um, lots of whiskey manufacturers or distilleries, I should say, have actually um, made NFTs now, or I or have a handful of them. But for me, I, I think it's a little bit more about tangibility when it comes to um, an item, or in this case, a product, and we're, we're knowing it to be a tangible asset. It's not digital artwork. Uh, we know it's a bottle of whiskey, it's something that we want to put our hands on and you know, eventually consume as well. So I guess my question to that, or how would I approach it, would just be more so of the curious mindset of, um, you know, perhaps I get this bottle with the NFT, but, but what else comes with that? What makes it uh, more lucrative? What makes it a little more attractive? And I guess that's really where you get the freedom with NFT to attach, perhaps, you know, some fantastic digital artwork uh, by our illustrator, Maddie Dye, or 
visits to the distillery or, you know, exclusive tastings or maybe rooftop parties. So um, I think I would be curious about the collectability form of the uh, NFT as well. Mm -hmm. Because we know the model is going to be collectible. If I'm going out and searching for something, uh, it's probably, you know, in a secondary market, I'm going to overpay grievously for it. Uh, but I'd like to know, you know, what's the NFT gonna, is that gonna maintain value? Is that going to increase in value over the time? Because like I said earlier, the amount of bottles of whiskey is only going to drop. There's just gonna be less and less, but that NFT will always be there. So are we gonna see the, the price of the whiskey increase and the NFT stay relatively stable? Or since the NFT is attached to the whiskey, is that gonna grow with the bottle? And I think that both based off of the product inside of the bottle. Um, both will grow up. Right. And the, once the whiskey consumer can grasp the NFT world and understand that, and you want to talk about the rare bottles of whiskey in our world, the Pappy Van Winkles of the world, mm -hmm. um, the McAllen uh, Distillier world, New York is of the world, right? These bottles that are astronomical. For average people, it is absurd to purchase that bottle. For someone that might have that income to purchase that bottle, still might be a little absurd, but they're gonna do it. But now, in doing so, they have an added value to it. And I'm more inclined to open the bottle and actually consume it because that's what whiskey's for. Whiskey's meant to be drank, you know, but I see this beautiful bottle and I have several of these bottles at home as well that I'm gonna wait for the special occasion, I'm not gonna open it. Which is silly, because you should open the bottle. But I think that now in the NFT world, I'm more inclined to open that bottle. So the NFT might surpass the cost of that bottle, knowing that as an owner in the NFT, I get to try what's next. I get to get educated on the next Glen Rothis 36 year old. And I will be educated on it, I will have access to it and I'm gonna drink this and I'm gonna enjoy it with the comfort knowing that I can get something more from it. I agree, it's interesting because it's really art plus, right? In this instance. So Maddie's artwork ties together with the bottle, right? It becomes the, you know, a special secondary packaging component and the NFT. But then the NFT unlocks these additional experiences and access to new, man to new information and beyond. So for sure, you're telling the story, it's all wrapped together, right? They're connected forever. But since the art comes with the plus, access to more, the art will take on a life of its own, predictably. And it seems- So you could drink the whiskey and still have additional value. Absolutely. And there seems to be, there, there's not just one NFT out there, right? There's levels to mm -hmm. NFTs. You have your static, you have your dynamic, but now you have what would be a social NFT because you're being invited to these and you have that social aspect. Mm -hmm. Am I right by saying that? Are there several different layers and styles? It of depends NFTs? on what the strategy is going into it and how the, um, the plan is built out both commercially and for marketing purposes, but yes. Understood. And now it seems to be that the consumer does not have to go out there and seek an NFT that whatever you're interested in, that's going to be coming to you in a short period of time as NFTs become more popular. As a brand, we decided to partner with Matty Dye, who is an extremely talented artist, to go with an expert that understands these NFTs within you and, and release it and we feel marketed to the right people. Um, how will NFTs change marketing? Yeah, I think they already are, and that's super interesting. So we're seeing all types of NFT launches in our space beyond your category. We're working in fashion, we're working in art, we're working in sports, um, film. We're doing a lot of charitable work. So we've put together programs surrounding Earth Day with Save the Chimps and beyond. So to activate um, you know, across these different business sectors with different reasons behind them, create a whole suite of different experiences and services, depending on who the creator is. Um, the other thing that I think is interesting to note, it's a little bit on a tangent, but interesting to note as it relates to the Glen Roth is specifically is that people are concerned um, 
about the environment and the environmental impact of yeah, NFTs. I wanted to get into this as well. Yeah, and I, I think it's like a good segue to mention that we were very deliberate in building an NFT um, for the Glen Rapids that is actually eco-friendly and doesn't have, you know, it maintains a very soft footprint on the planet. So every piece of digital artwork that we're minting in the form of an NFT, because we're on a proof of stake platform, Solana specifically, um, the amount of energy that goes into minting those NFTs for this project specifically is equivalent to the amount of energy that an individual would use when they're Google searching something or sending out a tweet. So it really is very limited and doesn't have a negative impact on the environment. And by comparison for Bitcoin, it gets continuing up and running. I believe every day releases the same amount of car the same carbon footprint that it takes to fuel electricity in Argentina for a day. So it's it's mm -hmm. I've read actually that it's even worse. So if an individual if we so we are not specifically we are not working on a um, proof of work um, blockchain protocol. Um, a proof of work blockchain protocol causes um, a lot of energy use. So effectively, if you mint one NFT, it's equivalent to the amount of energy that one person in the United States would use over a 30 day period. Wow. So for us, it's significantly um, marginal. It's literally the amount of energy that goes into sending a tweet. And I, and I love that because again, it practices our look beyond approach as a brand. Um, we always say you have to look beyond to find the Glen Rothfuss. Yeah. We're making it a little easier nowadays with our marketing, specifically with the NFT and the launch of this model. Uh, but you would have to take a deeper perspective to understand the process behind it. And I think that the Glen Rothfuss practices its ethos in that, in doing just that and ensuring our carbon footprint would not hurt the environment and we are practicing sustainability as Etrington does as a whole as a company. So thank you very much for bringing that up. I did want to bring that up as well. I appreciate that. Um, Matt, in, in, in terms of comparisons with our liquid, I think our liquid is very rare. I think that it speaks to a specific, specific whiskey consumer and someone that we say we're the whiskey drinkers of whiskey. Correct. Absolutely. Um, what would be the whiskey drinkers NFT outside of being able to go to a distillery and all this? What would you? What would be the? What would a whiskey drinker look at as an NFT? I gotta own that. Um, I mean, assuming that we're talking about the common interests of whiskey, um, exclusive tastings, memberships. Um, entry access points to private events. That for me would be a really big one. I think there's a lot of potential to start pulling stuff like that together and attaching it, um, you know, via an NFT to the purchase of a bottle or something along those lines. Um, How far do you think, this is for both of you handsome gentlemen, um, now it was the Glen Rothis bottle was the purchase and the NFT came. When do you think it'll be the NFT purchase and then the bottle after? Do you think that that'll be coming anytime? I mean, I, I speak with very limited experience. I'm sure you can elaborate quite a bit more. I feel like it could be that way right now. Um, to be honest, when, when I first learned about the 36, I knew that 36 was going to be essentially the bread and butter, you know, the, the prize, so to speak. Um, but I wasn't sure if the NFT was built around that or if that was accompanying the NFT. And I suppose it really, it comes down to the scale of what the NFT is versus what the bottle is. Because if we did, let's say this particular NFT, um, you know, an invitation to the distillery, you know, the, the live illustration from Maddie Dye, but we put it with our 12 year old bottle, then you're buying the NFT, you're just getting the bottle. So I, I feel like it's, um, that's really subjective right off the get go. The hook, the hook is most important. I think, um, Tommy, you're like really into predicting the future today. <laughs> so in my opinion, I think that, you know, houses like the Glen Roth is are going to start to use in the future this technology to um, create different experiences altogether. So there could be financially motivated experiences where if you purchase the NFT, 
it's backed by an asset like a bottle of whiskey, right? Um, if you purchase the NFT, you're a member in a club that perhaps spans more than just the 36. Maybe it's the entire product portfolio. Um, you'll see these different use cases rise within the whiskey space um, by, by activating the NFT. And I think that there could be multiple reasons to hold ownership of the NFT. That's, I'm excited for the future and what is to come in this world. Obviously, I was excited for the next release for a whiskey, but to understand that we're in uncharted borders in terms of NFTs, crypto and blockchain, it's really exciting. And I think that what stands out most of being a part of the NFT world is ownership. So, Tommy, you had mentioned Looking Beyond, and, and Looking Beyond is, to Glenn Roth, is since we've been in production since 1879, uh, it's become very much of a lifestyle. And I like to say Glenn Roth is that, that hidden gem, that diamond in the rough. It is the prize for the inquisitive mind, the curious person that is looking deeper and really wants to find something that maybe not everybody else has seen. Do you feel that is the same case with NFTs, that this is more so people need to look beyond to really understand and find NFTs? Or do you think in the near future, NFTs, I mean, just in very general terms, will be commonplace to the point where perhaps every household has an NFT or two? Yeah, that's an awesome question, truly. Um, I think the complexity of um, the mindset that you expressed as it relates to the Glenn Roth is collector as well as the whiskey itself is analogous to the complexity of what NFTs are bringing to the world. A great example, um, there was one artist, I think it was Damien Hurst, who basically put out a situation where he challenged you. He said, you could either keep the NFT or burn the NFT and keep the physical artwork, which will be more valuable. And I have friends that kept the digital artwork. Actually, I think today that digital artwork value has already spiked like exponentially. And I have others that burned the NFT and kept the physical artwork. So I think those complex situations are going to be all over the marketplace as we go deeper into this Web3 technology. Wow, that's really it's exciting. Amazing. Yeah. It's like Luke asking Grogu if he wanted the chain linked um, armor that <laughs> Mandalorian got for him. Yeah, exactly. For, for not Star Wars nerds, Mandalorian. Exactly. exactly. Mm -hmm. Baby Yoda. It's, it's, it's great. It's not Baby Yoda. Well, it's <laughs> Cut that one out, please. Thank you. <laughs> um, and yeah, I and Matt, you touched base on exactly what I wanted to wrap with in that the Glenn Roth is truly is that hidden gem and something that is so fun. You can learn so much about single malt scotch within the brand, let alone just the brand and the way that we practice things. It's beautiful. Our own cooperage at the distillery, uh, the history of the distillery in itself, the ghost still that's right next to us that was too big to move so it just stays there. Uh, the graveyard associated with the distillery that you'll see right behind that. And there's just like how you see so many hidden gems within Maddie's artwork you will find that in the liquid in itself. You will find all of these different nuances from the American oak, from the European oak, and all of those hints of the old rose are sharing how it connects with it. And I think the world of NFT is just as complex. And you can find exactly what you're looking for by taking the next step, by taking a deeper perspective, and by looking beyond, you'll find exactly what it is for you. Admittedly, it, it is very overwhelming. I found it to be so wild to step in and to try to understand this world. And reading your book has opened me up and I feel it's so much easier. And I know that people watching this, some of the verbiage that we did use might seem a little more, might seem a little complicated or not make perfect sense as when we're describing whiskey, which is just easy because it's out your nose, you're drinking it. Um, and if you find yourself in that, please comment within, reach out to us, but more importantly, please buy Mark's book. Um, <laughs> Mark's book Thank is you. a <laughs> cheat code to understanding this world and it breaks it down, again, in that classic New York way where it feels like you're talking to one of your buddies and I, 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 I can't That's say That's the best that. compliment, I love yeah. it. Excellent, yeah, awesome. it's, it, it really, and it, it's great because in a world that can get very difficult for someone to put it down into the terms of, listen, this is how it is. Yeah.
to his death, you know. And uh, you wear you wear many hats, and many titles. Uh, your best one being dad, of course. Uh, but I think that the way that you break this down, the NFTs, and specifically the Rolodex that you have, is really cool. Um, in your people <laughs> last week as well. But I think it, it, it will make a lot of sense for a lot of people that are looking to get into this world. Um, and if you find your way to a bottle of 36, I highly recommend picking it up. Um, and you will have all of these amazing events in the future uh, with Matt, with myself, with the entire brand team uh, to celebrate this beautiful achievement and this beautiful NFT world. And it's something that you own digitally but also something that you could touch and be a social part of. So thank you very much thank you. for thank you. putting us in this position um, as a brand for our brand to get out there and to allow us to educate the proper people um, for Maddie Dye to get her artwork out to so many other people as well, but uh, for taking the time to educate us about this world. And hopefully people will have a better understanding of NFTs in general and not just what the Glenn office is trying to do. Awesome. Um, anywhere, I, I, you were talking about your teaching, um, if someone was involved in this and wanted to get involved in one of your classes, where would they register? What, well, I teach at NYU, I teach a, an MBA class at NYU Stern. So a very easy school to get into. But start with the book, <laughs> the book, yeah, start with the book. The book is more more to the fact, the book is a really good story. Yeah, that, that the book's available everywhere. That, that was a way of trying to get you to flex your NYU muscles, but I think I worded it in the wrong way. <laughs> Professor Beckman. It's, yeah, it's, that's a great title as well. That's it. Um, but yeah, it's again, I, I do feel this is the future, but anything else that they could follow you on social media wise? Um, where, where can we see your blockchain, the NFTs that you own? I think um, if you start with the book, that's a good start. Excellent. Good stuff. And Matt, anything to plug, anything where we could see you, um, events that are coming up in this lovely space possibly, or where to follow you on social media, uh, what school are you a professor of as well? Oh, yeah. uh, I don't have those credentials. Okay. Uh, I was going to say Yale, but, uh, <laughs> uh, but no, absolutely. So we have uh, this space throughout the rest of the May month. Um, anybody and everybody is welcome. It's a free and public event space that we're using. Uh, or I should say on Thursdays, we're ho hosting public events. We're doing live jazz nights. Um, we're gonna have, like Tommy mentioned earlier, Sean Peen, a uh, very upscale men's clothing fashion designer, doing a pop-up shop here. Uh, we'll have, you know, obviously tasters of the Glen Rothis award-winning whiskey. We'll have live jazz music. Uh, we'll be doing another feature, a pop-up shop with James, um, James Lambden of Analog Shift. Sorry. I would cool. stop and run that back and go right again. Yeah. They'll cut it out. Yeah. Okay. Uh, we'll be doing another uh, essentially pop-up shop with James Landon of Analog Shift, uh, which will be displaying some of his watches, uh, also available for purchase, and then doing the live jazz evening as well. Uh, but we'll be filling the space out with uh, free events throughout the rest of the month. So do be sure to check on eventbrite.com. You can just look up the Glen Rothis and you can see what we're doing locally. Like I said, it's free to attend as well. So please do come down, uh, speak with me, let's talk whiskey, you know, if nothing else. Excellent. And follow him on Instagram at Glenn Rothis Matt for all things outside of this space. Uh, thank you guys so much. Hope you guys learned a little bit about NFTs and we look forward to sharing a dream with you in the near future. Cheers. Thank you.